before we're seated, let's grab the passage today. We've been in James for several weeks. We're in the last three messages of James chapter 5 before we close out the entire book of James. We did that, church. Some of y'all never been through a whole book, but now you have. I'm going to say it's one of the shorter ones, so it's a good start. But we'll start working on the Gospels, too, and the other books that will help you, you know, take baby steps. Anyway, James chapter 5, verse 1 through 6. When you have it on the screen, say amen. See, I didn't say Bibles. <laughs> when you have it in your Bible, who has a Bible today? What's a paper? God bless you, Micah. He's got paper. He's got an index. This is good. God's taking it back old school. All right, I'll quit messing around. James chapter 5, verse 1. Now listen, you rich people. Let me point out here, the Bible doesn't say that he's not talking to just outsiders. He also is talking to insiders. Now, he didn't call them brethren or sister, but it's unsure that he's maybe not also speaking to those next to you in your row right now. So just because you think he's, he's fussing at the outsiders, I, last time I checked, we, we could be who he's talking to. Is that possible? Can somebody be the rich person in here today with me? that he's about to say a couple slams and prophetic Jesus talk. And we like that. We like God correcting us because that's how we get better, right? Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. It's so exciting here at One Seed. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you soon. Your wealth has rotted. How many like rotten food? I mean, like rotten fruit with the fruit flies. People are getting a visual now. God is speaking to someone's heart today when he says, your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. The corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, everybody say, look. The wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your grass are crying out against you. It's really fields. I'm just giving you some practical adaptation here. The grass, the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves, and not in a bad way. This is a good way. Like the calves, yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have fattened yourself up, he says, to the rich, ready for the slaughter that the Lord is bringing. This is really depressing. Maybe we should stop here. No, let's keep going. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not even opposing you. They didn't even do nothing to you, and you murdered them, he says here. Now, before you're seated... I just want to preface, he is speaking to the first century wealthy demographic, but God does something in the practical in 2023 too, otherwise the Bible wouldn't still be alive, amen? If it was just for them, we wouldn't need to preach this today. So maybe our thinking is a little too narrow because you say, well, I'm not into moths and I'm not rich and I don't do none of this and I'm good, yay me, go home, give me a Starbucks. But you're going to see God is good like that. God is good like that. The Bible is a mirror. It's like a two-edged sword. And when you look in it, he will correct you into a way that exposes the, the, the dark in our life to bring the goodness forward. You may take your seats this morning in the name of Jesus. My subject today is holding on to emptiness. Holding, everybody do this, holding onto emptiness. How do you hold it if it's empty? That's a good point. Holding on to emptiness. Who likes to hold stuff? Camilla. Camilla, my daughter, likes to hold stuff. She's almost two. She will hold everything she's not supposed to hold. She will hold things that damage the floor. She likes to walk the line of risk at her age. And she likes to hold stuff. That's, that doesn't mean anything for today, except she likes to hold stuff. But let me tell you about our Saturday routine. Can I, can I tell you something really exciting to me that we do on Saturdays that y'all are going to be like, this is crazy when I come to One Seed Church. We do shipping and inventory at our house 
when we get back in town on Saturdays, because often we're, we're at the lake, and when we arrive, there's 400 boxes. Does anybody else have a problem with Amazon? One person has a problem with Amazon. We got some dishonest folks because there's a reason UPS is starting to come back to my door. It's because we're overloading their stores with all the boxes. Can I get an amen, Cody? How many know that UPS used to come to the door for free, depending on your return reason, but then they got so slammed, they started making, Amazon started making you take it back to the store for your return, and then you were upset about that. And that went on for like two years. Does anybody know this like me? Am I the only one obsessed with this? Now, on the bigger items, guess what? UPS is coming back to the door for free. Thank you, Cody. No more strikes. <laughs> Cody works for UPS. When we've been out of town for a while and we get home, I'm not joking. We've got people in this church who have witnessed. It is like a warehouse waiting that exploded. So when you got to deal with this kind of volume, and a lot of times we're, we're navigating multiple projects, including church things. Sometimes we don't have a receiver here at the church, so we ship it home, and we bring it there, and we do all this stuff. And it's really nice. And we have to manage returns. We've got printers. We've got tape guns. We've got arrivals, departures. We don't have pallets, but we have everything else. And my kids are trained military styles, military styles, Sandy. When we get home, it's like boom, boom, boom. Return, put it over there. Give me the scissors. Give me the fat Sharpie. Give me the scotch tape. Give me the fat tape. Give me, give me all the boxes from here or there, but don't open them yet because you're going to throw me out of rhythm. Everything's timed. And we get it done in like 45 minutes, like 400 boxes. And what's so funny, it's like chips. You see all these boxes, right? And then when you empty all the boxes and you put them all in your garage, you're left with like three things on the counter. Has anybody noticed they like to overpack the boxes? And, and they, they got the bubble things in there that all you, all you adults still like to do it too. You pop them. And they're like, ooh, big bubble, bubble wrap for adults. Pop, pop, pop. And so almost everything in the box is empty. And you don't realize it's empty until you <clears throat> break down the boxes. How many like to use box cutters and break down boxes and nicely cut them up? And you're just like, oh, this looks so nice. And it goes from a garage full to a little pile because the boxes were empty, right? And even in the, even the products, it was like a, just a little bit of the box and everything else was just bubble wrap and air. So from the outside, it looked really vast and, and, and productive and a lot, of, a lot of accumulation. But on the inside, it was really three things and two of them went back anyway to Amazon the next day. It's, it's a perceptive thing. We, we look like we've acquired all these things, and when you condense it down, it's just a bunch of empty boxes. Here's another one for you. How many have bought chips out of a vending machine or family style from, family size from the grocery store, and you get the bag of chips, and you open the bag, and there's four chips in it? What's the rest? Oxygen, air, it's empty. It looks full and plentiful, but on the inside, there's nothing. Three chips. Red Hot Ripless used to really burn me that way. Who, like Red Hot Rip Who likes Red Hot Ripless? Old Vienna. They're from St. Louis, I think. <laughs> Nobody likes them but me and Nate. What a sad church. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I know you all like your Lay's plain. Okay, yellow bag. Holding on to emptiness. If I grab one of those boxes and I squeeze it, I could tape it all real nice. It looks pretty good. But if it's empty and I squeeze it, what's going to happen? It's going to collapse because there's nothing really in there. And, and that's kind of what he's preaching about here. He's, the Bible is always practical, literal, and spiritual, and prophetic, and illustrative, to other things. It's all the above. And not only is he preaching against the wealth of the first century here that literally are holding on to their riches and using it as their safeguard against anything bad that can ever happen to them, and in the process they're hurting people, but he's also speaking to 1C Church in 2023 that somebody's holding on to this stuff through their life when maybe they're holding on something that's hollow on the inside, but they won't let it go. They won't let it go. Well, that's all I know. I don't know how to let it go. You got to set it down first. That helps. Then you got to quit keeping it in there. That helps. Holding on to 
emptiness. How do you hold on to something that's empty? Right. Exactly. But that's what we're doing. We're holding on to emptiness. Touch your neighbor, tell them you're full of it. What y'all think this is some kind of slang derogatory comment in American culture? This is spiritual. Tell them you're full of it. You got to give them a dirty look. You're full of it, Cody. What are we full of? You ever full of? You ever heard you're full of hot air? But you heard that one. Maybe not to you, but you've heard that figure of speech. We are taught to consume it all, to be full by emptiness. And the problem with consumption is even when it's air, you only got so much room in your heart, in your life, in your mind. Let me tell you, I need a RAM upgrade in 2023. I thought I had a lot, where are my computer nerds today? I thought I had like a 64 gigabyte brain. I need 128 to keep it going sometimes. That's a super nerd, nerd joke for today. It's, it's funny if you like that kind of stuff. <laughs> the more you consume, the less you can bring in. So if you are consumed by the things that hold no value, that bring you to despair, because what does emptiness do? It brings you to a place of despair. It's not what I thought. You ever heard that? Ah, it's not what I was, it's not what I thought it would be. That's because it didn't bring you what you thought it would bring. And so then it brings you this sense of emptiness, and when you carry emptiness long enough and you're full of it, you start living in despair. Now life doesn't look half full, it looks half empty on Monday. Now I'm not quite as excited about the promotion I got last year because now I'm used to it. Like, it's a, it's a mindset based on consumption. And so being an efficient church, I want you all to declutter your minds of the things that hold no value so you can hold the things of God because that's where fruit grows. If you're not rooting new seed in your garden because it's choking on old thorns, guess what's not going to grow? Good fruit. What's going to happen? Hydroponic garden is going to choke to death and die in your hearth room with all the lighting that I gave it. How many like hydroponic gardens? It's a, t- it's a touchy subject with me right now because it's all dying. And my kids keep telling me, but nobody wants to get on YouTube and figure it out. See how nerdy we are? We go to YouTube. What happened to getting out in the dirt? I don't know. We YouTube it. Figure out the gardens with YouTube. Have you ever found yourself gathering something you ended up not using as you thought you would? You know, you like to save everything. (laughs) That was an inside joke with my my aunt, my sister. You know, you know somebody that likes to save everything. Can I get an amen? This is not a bad thing. I'm I'm just teasing. This is not a bad thing always. When it comes time to maximize these things, though, that you've saved, you get a little lost in it. How many get lost in all the stuff they've saved? They thought it would make them be more productive, but now they're lost in the, the zoo of saved stuff. Can I say stuff? That's what it is. You get lost in it. You're not, a, you're not, you're not leveraging the consumption. And when you go to sift through it, what do you do? You buy it again because it just gets too time-consuming to go find the one you saved. You buy it again. I can't tell you how many times I bought the same thing for church not with church money. That's, this is just, you know, when I want to spend my own money on random church stuff that's not important. Um, that I end up having three of. Y'all like that? That was a joke. Um, maybe it's flip-flops. I'm afraid I don't have a pair of flip-flops, so I buy another pair, and I keep finding some with the tags on it. Does anybody have that problem? Okay, we're getting somewhere. Uh, you talk about church, you talk about the Bible, they give you deer and headlights. You talk about flip-flops, they laugh. Okay, that works. <laughs> flip-flops in Jesus' name. But you didn't end up saving any time is the point by saving this. And people save stuff, and it brings them this sense of control and comfort. They save money in this way, which is a great thing. It's good to be conservative. Really, it is. You should be conservative, prepared, have a storehouse. But if you over-accumulate and don't use, everything has expiration, no? Especially food. You know it don't taste right when it's two years old and it's still full? It's because you wanted to save it. And now you're tossing it by the wayside. It's, it's, there's something in accumulating that the human mind uses as a sense of 
comfort, and control. So by accumulation, we think we have control. But really, our faith starts falling into that. And we start losing our faith in God. And so that's when it becomes dangerous. It's like people say, money is the root of all evil. No, it doesn't say that. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. And guess what? The love of anything that takes the priority of God in your life is the root of all evil. Can I get an amen, somebody? So maybe it's not your money, but it's what your money bought. Yeah. Your money can buy drugs. It can buy, it can buy bad things for your head. It can buy the TV that got you watching that thing that got your mind in the gutter. It can buy you the computer that got you online chatting to somebody that you don't even know, and they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be dressed like that. And like all these things, you know, like, like, like that's what it will do. And as you consume it, guess what you leave no room for? God. And so this is exactly what James is preaching to the rich generation of, the, of this first century because they were blinded. And it's not the first time we've talked about it in this, this series. There's a theme here. They continue to be distracted with the faithfulness in their stuff, that's called idolatry, over the faithfulness in God, who's the only God. There's none beside me. I'm a jealous God. And when you put your faith in your money and you put your faith in your control, you don't have faith in me because you only have faith when you know you need me. And if you don't know you need me, you'll believe that stuff actually does something until you get sick, until your baby's sick, until your friend is hurt, until your mind is torn. We gather these things, but in the moments of real need, we still feel empty. Are we holding on to what's keeping us empty? Are we holding on to emptiness? If I'm holding it all the time, I'm holding on to emptiness. What I hold on to is where I build my tabernacle. That means house, my place of residence, my address for Jesus. If I'm living in my consumption, I'm living in what I offspring in my consumption, which is despair, emptiness, and that's what we're full of. He talks about them being fatted up for the slaughter. Because in, in farming, a fatted cow is a great thing, but you don't want to be the cow. Can I get an amen? So he did a swap -a here. He said, but actually, you are the calf. You are for the slaughter because you fatted yourself up with your riches. Who likes vacations? Silly question, right? Is there anybody who doesn't like a vacation? And can I just have a conversation with you right now to tell me why? Okay, I'm going to talk to me. I don't like it after five days, PJ, because I get out of rhythm. I get out of order. I start losing my rhythm. I know you all know what I'm talking about. There's a rhythm to the chaos, and that's what keeps you centered. And I have a five-day limit on our, we like to go to Gulf Shores. Love it. I don't know how y'all do the two-month thing. I'd go crazy because after five days, I'm like, my life has no purpose. They call it workaholic. That's how, the, I think that's what it really is. You get beach brain, and, and you don't even know how to drive the street no more. And all of a sudden, you're renting slingshots and driving on the road, doing nothing all day, and life's meaningless. <laughs> it's cool for five days, but that's comfort. That's a joke for comfort. When we take a beach trip, Jen, you were there. When we take a beach trip, it's comfortable. But you know what it did? Me and her had this talk. It puts the spotlight on what you have back home, amen? It puts the spotlight because you need a break, but you don't want to stay there. That's what they were doing. They live in that world. They live in that beach world. I'm not saying if you want to be a beach bum, that's just a figure of speech. It doesn't mean you're really a bum. I'm not criticizing nobody here. Don't send me an email. I'm just saying, like, if you want to live that way, that's all you. But I can't do it. I got a five-day window before you got to give me something to work on, you know? And what, what it does for me, the break is it gives me focus back on the mission. It gives me focus back on the blessing right here at home. But the rich people in this text I'm not saying rich people, the rich people in this text were staying in that consumptive world. 
it's a mindset. It doesn't mean they're really on the beach. Maybe they're by the Sea of Galilee. I don't know. And they're just chilling all day with a nice tan and drinking, drinking uh, you know, some virgin pina coladas frozen. I don't know if they had a mixer. I don't know. I don't care. What I'm saying is they were living in a mindset that was so comfortable they never did nothing or see, saw the need for it. And in the process, the Bible says they were hurting the innocent field workers because they're too tight with their wallet to even pay them the wages. And then they said they actually, some of them died. So you thought it was bad when they didn't clean your house good and you didn't want to pay them full price for the maid, the maid cleaning. These kind of laborers, when they didn't get paid, some of them actually died, the Bible says. So then they were calling them murderers. James was calling the rich murderers. You didn't think of it like that. You just thought they were snobs. They were murderers because they withhold taking care of the brethren. And they didn't even know it. They didn't even know it. That's what overconsuming does. It takes you to this place of being clueless to your surrounding. And so James is preaching against this. And guess what they found themselves often in? Emptiness. Guess why? Because they needed more. They needed more. They kept putting their investment in something that kept bringing what? Empty boxes. Emptiness. They were full of it from the outside. Man, they had some nice Instagram pictures. But on the inside, empty. Empty, because they were consuming something that was empty in eternity, taking the priority of what is sustained and plentiful in eternity, which is the things you can't put a price tag on. It's a thing you can't put something on until it's a real situation. You can't metric the real situations on how you'll react until you're in them, and that's where the value is at. How many have been in something so bad that it changed them for the better in a good way forever? And they're grateful for the, the pain they went through. How many like to suffer? Not all the time, but a little bit of suffering if you endure it. Patience is created. Long suffering. Joy is created out of these situations of emptiness. So he's trying to get them to turn their minds because they're going to die that way if they don't. They're going to die on empty. He's telling them, get to the gas station and get some gas in the tank for Jesus because you rich people, you might die on empty, is what he's saying. Because right now you're living in emptiness. It's corruption. It's fake. I can't stand fake, fakeness. I never got the, like, polished pastor award. It's because I can't fake it. I could really do a good job if I tried, but it would be fake. You know, like the politically correct thing, and that's why I didn't do this for a long time, because I think I was just too honest, because I would just really say it. He, he really said that? Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Then I realized, after a couple years, the society is starving for that. They're tired of the show. They want authenticity, even though we do have a haze machine coming. I'm just saying it's in the back. We like the toys, but Jesus is the center of the mission. And you can have fun in church. Uh, I'm not being blessed if it's not miserable. Says what scripture? None. You can thank your ancestors for twisting the Bible into something that is not. That's not what I read. I read the joy of the Lord, the peace of God, a sound mind, heart, peace, love, the fruit of the Spirit. That is where God wants to take your life. And living in emptiness will not find it, but it might get your attention. Because what they were doing is hoarding, hoarding blind. If it's there, I got to consume it. I got I to consume it. Like Scrooge McDuck, just give me, give me, give me, give me. Take, 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 take. Give me, give me. Hoarding. How many know a hoarder? How many remember the show? Can you believe those were real people? Wow. Wow, I think they took it off the air because it was damaging America by seeing such graphic illustrations of people's messes. Ew. Ew. Sorry. If you're on Instagram, if you're on social media, you could fall into hoarding blind with your eyes. What you see, you consume. What you consume, you reproduce. We're being taught one thing, but we're looking for the answer that will only come by this thing 
called the faith in Jesus. And can I say, I love all people, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There was no one beside me, says the Lord. So I can't be that nice and say, everything's fine. It's just you think, this, you think the church is the, you think that the ceiling's God and you want to worship the God? So did the idols that worshiped the calf and God destroyed it. And Moses had to beg him, please don't do that again. I'm sorry. Like, like it's not all about feel good. It's about faithfulness to the one true God who created the heavens and the earth. And the church has to have a backbone. Not a jelly spine. We're not, we're not skiing young PJ on the lake when my legs are just like jello. That's not the church. We need to be firm foundation. The rock on which I stand. Why do you think he, why is Jesus the rock? The Bible says if you stand on anything else, it's like a house on quicksand. It cannot stand. A house divided against itself is like quicksand. It can't stand. But if you build it on the rock of ages, it will thrive, grow, and defeat the enemy day in, day out. You can take that home with you. It's free. I have this issue with LaCroix. Who likes LaCroix? What did he say? What is he drinking? It's just zero-calorie carbonated water, people. It sounds a little bit like sinful. Okay. It's just carbonated water. The only sin in it is that most people think it tastes bad. I think it tastes good. It's just carbonated water with no, no soda syrup. So you don't want to, you know, I'm trying to work on the waistline. So I, I, have, I drink, like, a lot of LaCroix, and, and I have this weird habit with the can. Pray for me. Whenever it's got three sips left, guess what? I put it back in the fridge. I never will finish the can. I've been doing this my whole life, even with other soda. I never will finish the can. I'll, I'll save it. Why do I do that? What is my mind trying to do here? What is, the, what is the Dr. Phil moment here in my problem childhood of, that I don't know about that is causing me to never dispose the empty can? As long as there's a drop, I keep it. Some of y'all need to throw the cans out and quit saving the drop that's flat anyway because it's been in, it's been in your fridge for a week because you've been at the lake. So quit saving the thing. Dump it. Throw it out. You've been collecting cans like you're going to cash that in and actually make more than a nickel. How many collect cans when they're kids and crush those things? You got to collect like a million to make five bucks. I told my boys it's a bad process. Don't start a can business. Let's think of something more fruitful. Or the, not the cans, the, the tabs. When my, my brother was a kid, he had bags of the cans and you'd crush them. He got like a dollar after like 20 years. He was old and gray before he got a buck out of the thing. Forget that. Forget those cans. Quit sticking the can in there of your heart and holding on to that one drop of goodness that came from all that turmoil. It's empty. It's empty. Touch your neighbor and say, that's empty. Quit holding it. You think I'm talking about cans? I'm talking about your heart. You're holding something today that's got a drop left because they kissed you good once and they were just so nice when you were 15 and now they're, they're abusive. Let them go. They're an empty can. They were so sweet when I met them in high school. Now they're poison. It was so nice when I got that car. Now the engine don't work. Get a job. Get a new car. It's empty. Trade it. It's not working. Get a gig. Come on. Quit saving the empty pile of metal. It's not coming back. Touch your neighbor and tell me it's not coming back. It's over. The can is empty. Crush that thing like a devil's head in the garden. Can I get an amen, Jen? You're going to leave here today getting a LaCroix and going, man, that was so good. I'm going to drink LaCroix like the pastor and God's going to touch me. And I'm going to throw it away when it's empty. And God's going to speak to your heart over that. I would say accolades are the thing today that do this the biggest. In 2023... God kept speaking the word accolades to me. People get caught up in this generation with the title, the, the award, the, the recognition ribbon. And when you take it away, I just have no purpose. Why would some old stinky ribbon from 1987 define your purpose in 2023? 
People use an accolade to find value. We could call it a job title. If you take away their job, they have no meaning. It's because they put their faith in their job. Maybe it's their marriage. And God forbid, but if it doesn't work out, that did not define who you were created to be. The job didn't define who you were created to be. And God willing, thank you, Lord, I needed to be fired because that's what got me my own business doing what I actually was supposed to do. You know, maybe that's what God is doing. You ever wanted to find an old boss and say, thank you for firing me. Woo, so good. Thank you. Okay, just me. What I'm saying to y'all is that's what's got to happen. you got to detach from the recognition and say, who am I doing this for? What is my title to God? Does it have to go on my shirt? No, I don't need to wear a cross to know the cross is on my life. I don't have to show it to let it be in me because it will just bear from me. I'm not talking about showing your heart for God. I'm talking about wearing things to validate to others your spirituality, wearing things to validate to others how good an athlete you were in 1987 at the homecoming game in football, ninth grade, whatever. Those are great things, but that doesn't define you. That is not who you are today. That person's gone. You know, sometimes I look at some old videos when I was acting silly doing, like, some music stuff, and I say, man, I look really silly if I did that now. Like Janet Jackson moves. I look really silly. I got some gray hair. I got five kids. I can see dirty looks from my kids. If I tried to keep living in the thing that was cool when I was 15 before I even had a razor, then I'm going to look pretty silly at 44 doing the same thing. You know? Let go of that. That doesn't define me. And guess what? When you let go of the accolade that's holding you back or the title, God's going to show you something new you have an interest in. That's a big one. I just don't have any hobbies. Find one. Do something. Faith doesn't wait for the finish line. It starts walking the race saying there will be a finish line. We didn't build this church saying there's got to be a finish line before we start. You start going. You start buying the stuff. You get the sound system. You start buying the movie theater. You just start renovating, and the people will come when you go forward first. You step, I step. There's a reason it's on our hat. Do we have a hat for that? I thought so. Or is it a shirt? We have both. Okay, it's been a while. I'm getting it. forgetful in my old age. I don't know what merch we own. If you let that emptiness go, God is going to show you something new you have a passion in. Maybe you're a computer guy and you're going to discover woodworking. Maybe you're, maybe you're like a mechanic and you're going to fall in love with fishing. Like there's so many avenues your life can go. You don't need to stay stuck in that thing because they took it away from you. They didn't take it away from you. Maybe God let it go so you could grow. Maybe that's what really happened. Well, you just keep telling yourself, well, I don't know. It's like that friend, they just keep telling, they ask you a question, and they keep telling you back the same answer. How many times we got to tell you, no, we think you're making a mistake. You shouldn't do that. Well, do you really think? Yes. How many times are you going to ask? You clearly don't want to know. You clearly don't want to grow, because if you did, you would just say, that's it. This is the rock I stand on. It's firm. That's it. He won't. I'm moving forward. That's how you got to live your life. Don't hold on to the junk. It's empty. And they couldn't see it. And they were toxifying their own spiritual soil into disaster for the slaughter. Churches today don't like to say, like, heaven and hell and, you know, like, everybody's a sinner and you must come to the Lord to be saved. and all. But the Bible says if you don't come forward, you are falling by the wayside. It's a choice. It's serious. It's a health decision. It's a decision we got to choose to make. When you wake up on January 1st, 2024, and you go, I'm going to start a workout program this year, and I'm going to eat really good. No one's going to move the weights for you. No one's going to stop you from eating the Cheetos in the pantry if you're going to keep walking yourself in there. Even if you try to lock the door, you might find the key and open it anyway. No one's going to do it. It's a choice. Their faith had become elevated into the things of destruction, distracting them from God's will. And so they didn't realize they were unhealthy. They were spiritually starving. There's something I wanted to point out that I didn't point out, that I wrote on the paper. 
over-consuming these things makes us heavy with the burden of spiritual starvation. Starving, starvation. When you hear starvation, your, your life's on the line. It's not like you're a little malnourished, you need some calories. You're starving. And when we consume the, the artificial of this world to the point that we are blind by it, living in it, faithful to it, we are spiritually entering into starvation. And that hurts to hear. And that will hurt your heart in a good way because God's trying to tell you, you need some nutrients. It's not working. Change your diet, it's a health decision. And if I can't remember what emptiness feels like, how can I remember what needing Christ is? They were too comfortable on the beach. They never went back to St. Louis. They stayed there so long, they didn't know they needed God anymore. They had brain frog to the flesh. Verse 3 says, your, your gold and silver corroded. It's expired. You're holding on to expiration. That thing's expired. Throw it out. Let it go. It's an empty box. That lifestyle takes away my sight. And God wants to restore somebody's vision today. Because they got a lot of boxes in their garage. But they're empty. Is anybody else collecting some boxes that they can't let go of? And they're empty. Am I the only one? Okay. I don't preach this just to me. I preach it so God may bless you. And when you open up your heart, God's going to expose something to you. So amen to that. Get rid of the boxes. It's corrosive. It's corroding. He says, at the very end of his passage, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. Hmm. Y'all say, well, I didn't, I didn't kill anybody. Yes, you did. We killed Jesus on the cross with the curse of our flesh. Now, we weren't physically there. We didn't physically put him up there. But James is so good. He's the half-brother of Jesus. here. He's not just speaking to the rich about the people out in the fields. He's speaking to what they did to the Messiah at this point. This is an epistle. This is after the cross. You murdered the innocent one. And so... He had to get them there because they were so numb to the need that until they recognized they were David with Bathsheba, that that was them, that they are the man, until they recognized they did it too, they will not know that they need something greater to fix it. Because again, they're living in their self-sufficiency. And so he says, you did it too. We all did it too. Until you recognize that how good we are doesn't fix it, it's coming to your knees and recognize that only God fixed it on the cross. Should we decide to walk through the doorway of grace through faithfulness, then God can reconciliate the brokenness of our past and make us new into the image he created us to be. That's the only way it happens. And you won't see that or feel that or find that until you break away from the boxes and come into a church and get a little word in you so someone else can water that thing when you leave church today and you can start going, I'm not as whole as I thought. It was just a bunch of poppy packing plastic in my boxes all this time and I thought I was living large and living good and that's good. We're not saying be down in your mind but be lifted up knowing God is the, God is the counselor. You're not your own counselor. Quit calling Dr. Phil and call Dr. Jesus. Because guess what? His show doesn't even go on TV. His show is all over the globe. And it's never been taken off the air. And his word is his manuscript. And this is a script that never gets old. You don't have to read it on a teleprompter. You can read it on your own Bible. You know why the self-help book section is so big? It's because none of it works half the time. So they keep putting out another book. I know a self-help God that has the word in his book that can cure all things. You can say, I gotta have this. That's good too. But don't discredit Jesus over what you gotta have to fix it. Because clearly, you're still taking that medicine. You're still taking the same thing. And it's not fixing none of nothing. It's just making it the same. It's keeping it at bay. God's a healer. Y'all can stand. God wants to heal somebody. God performs miracles. He doesn't fix it. He restores it. He gets rid of it. He doesn't put a Band-Aid on you. He didn't go to the cross so he could band-aid you.
you got to be grounded in grace. This is what this means. When you live in God's grace, that is not saying I can do whatever I want anytime. It doesn't matter because God has grace for me. That's abusive language. Shame on the devil for tricking you into thinking that lie. Grace is saying, I will give you a way when you are hungry. I will give you a doorway. Even when you keep shutting it on me, I will never turn the doorway. I'm not going to justify what you did, but I'm never going to take away the door to allow you to walk through if you want to. That's what grace does. And it keeps us in a pure mindset of why God is always there. You could take away the riches. You could make us poor. You could take away the blessing. You can make us sick. You could take away all the goodness. You can make us sad. And you still know at the end of the day, grace is what you're standing on. That's what it does. It's your mindset said. And they didn't have this. They didn't have this. So they were lost sheep. And so to be found, you got to realize I'm not a, not as strong as I thought. My riches only carry me so far. You can clap for that. I know it's weird. Some of y'all don't know what it's like to, to like show God some excitement. When you show God some love, he shows you love back. When you praise, the heavens open. When you rejoice and sing the worship, the, the heavens come down here on earth. What do you think the kingdom is? What do you think the kingdom is? The kingdom is not this children's palace and I walk through a door. The kingdom is the soil of your heart. And when you bring God's people together, you bring the kingdom into fruition, into St. Charles County. And it comes alive and it starts breathing life to wounded people. That's what here on earth as it is in heaven means. It's a health decision. I want to close with this story. It's not a story. It's a moment. My Camilla is um, almost two. Camilla, shout out. She's been extra quiet. I don't know what's going on. She's usually hollering at me the whole time. She's going through this sleep phase. She's the pre-terrible twos. How many know what terrible twos are? No, no, no. Guess what word she knows really well? No, no. Does she know yes? No, she doesn't. And guess what? She knows, she knows oh no, oh no, everything's, oh no, and then Rice Krispie, she knows Rice Krispie, and um, she's going through this phase now where, I mean, I'm just going to say, she loves her mom and all, but she's with her mom all the time, and they have their, their bonding moment at bedtime, but lately she's doing this thing where she pops back up and screams, she screams, and Michelle's like, I don't know, she just, she won't sit still, she won't, she said, I, I, said, I said, let me go in there, I'm a dad. She is instantly quiet. Instantly. I, I, have a, I have a technique with five kids. I put her down here. Her head's here. I got a pillow. I rock her, and I hold her snug, and she is instantly staring at me. I mean, instant. And it's not because I'm holding her too tight or nothing like that, but now she wants her daddy too, and that's really cool. And I'm sharing that with y'all because it's kind of funny. It can be nap time. It can be bedtime. And no matter what, she's doing this thing. We're like, my mom will give me what I want. Ah, ah, ah. You know, she's screaming her head off. And I walk in there. I say, okay, let's go to sleep. And I grab her and boom, she's out. I mean out. And she does, I told you she does the, the funny eye thing where she'll stare at you. Are you really there still? She'll watch you for another 20 minutes. But then when I see the mouth open... And I check the arms limp. It's like checking in the, in the UFC when they're choked out. Like, is the arm falling? Okay, they're out, out. Okay. And I just I just gently put her back in the bed. I'm out of 5G, you know. Like, that's the rhythm we got right now. And guess what? I don't care how many great things I get in my life. I cannot replace that. And there's something special when your child is just staring at you in the eye as they pass out. And, and, and they're, just, they're just zoned out. And it don't have to be a baby today. I'm just giving you my personal story that that's a moment that, that, that my accolades can't get. That's a moment that my money can't replace. That's a moment that my hollering for Jesus can do something about. That's how she got here because we prayed and gave God the glory that says, if it be your will, God, we're okay with only four. I know it sounds crazy. And then a fifth one showed up two years later after we thought it was over and sold all the girl stuff. It was great. And I'm saying, like, I can't replace that. And that is what you're supposed to replace these empty boxes with. 
Okay, I'm bringing it around. You getting this? You're carrying a box. You want to quit doing that? Then put something in it like a baby, like the Word of God, like your family, like that neighbor that you can hug and nothing's, nothing's going away. It's in there. She's in there. I put her head in there and I grab her and I sit back and I scroll Instagram while she goes to bed and it's the greatest moment of my day because I emptied out the boxes and I put in something only God could fulfill and that's where the joy comes and that's where the peace comes and that is the only way you will feel that with God. Your money, rich people of century one, you can't get that until you get it right with God. God wants to put something in your box today. He wants to fill your pantry with a lot of canned drinks today of goodness, peace, joy, that's how you find it. You got to empty it so he can fill it. Touch your neighbor, tell him you got to empty it so he can fill it. You got to empty it. Come on, somebody. You got to empty it so he can fill it. If you don't dump it out, there's no room. And I'm grateful for that. How many are grateful that he has grace, that if you thought you ran out of boxes, he'll drop one at your doorstep. He'll give you another one. He'll give you another chance to replace that despair with goodness. It's not too late. Quit telling yourself the world don't love you. Who cares about the world? Jesus loves you. You want mental health? Get in God's Word. God's Word can't be defeated. I don't need no drug for this. I got the Word of God. I'm high on the Word of God because it fixes me. It doesn't wear off. If I want my mental welfare to be good, I got to be grounded in what's good. And I'm going to surround myself with what's good. And I can stand strong because he is my firm foundation. Let's go to prayer and worship God like he's filling somebody's box today. Every head bowed, every hand lifted together. We glorify your name, Lord. We bring the presence of God into St. Charles County. And some people aren't used to feeling the power of your spirit. They're not used to feeling this. They're not used to feeling the anointing come and stir their hearts in a way that they have never sensed before. But God, we know the good fruits that you bear because we bear from your tree. And God, we want, we want that seed to land on fresh hearts today so it can root something special and they can go into the world like legion and say what good things the God, the God of all has done for me. What good things Jesus Christ has done for me. My glass is full. My cup runneth over. God is good no matter what my circumstance. God is good no matter what comes my way. I've got a Jehovah Jireh. Jesus saves his people from their sins who went to a cross for me and even when I killed him, he still loves me anyway. He still said comes Come, son and daughter, come back to me. Just because you didn't know, now you know you can walk through by grace. I give you the door. We thank you, God, for the opportunity. And if the house of God could say, in Jesus' name, everybody say, amen.